Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Adventure Before Dementia. I'm your host, Russ Barkley. And on what other channel would you be able to see a 73-year-old man dress up like Jack Sparrow and do a research review on ADHD, much less follow that up with a rather hypomanic 73-year-old man who discusses the keys to success in kids and teens with ADHD and then blames his manic free associative episode on his nasal spray. Well, I have to tell you, I'm back on the nasal spray still, so look out. After all, I've had another dose of this stuff, so not going to miss my shot. Shout out to Hamilton there. In uh, news, and I know inquiring subscribers want to know, did Moose get his contract renewed? Well, yes, he did, and he took me out for a beer at a local craft brewery just outside Richmond the other day, and here we are enjoying our outing. So shout out to Moosey as well. Thanks, buddy. Glad you got the contract. Don't ask for a raise yet. Hope to see you on a future episode. Today, I want to talk to you about working memory and what to do about this problem that is so common among kids, teens, and adults with ADHD. And I title this, Working Memory Isn't Working. And instead, what you have is this just cluster of shrubbery, so to speak, uh, in the mind when it comes to holding things in mind that we need to do to guide behavior over time. Because after all, working memory is memory being put to work. So my thanks to freepick.com for the use of this free picture and uh, by photographer Diller. This particular lecture is also based upon my book for parents on 12 principles for raising a child with ADHD. So have a look at that if you'd like. More content is in there than I can cover in this brief presentation. Now, as you know, I've already spoken about the fact that working memory is not very good in people with ADHD when I talk to you about the brain as a knowledge performance device. So I'm not going to go into that other than to highlight once again that we have knowledge acquired and stored in the back part of our brain. And then when we activate that, it moves forward into the frontal lobe and used to guide motor performance. So mental representations about knowledge, time, goals, tactics is activated and then is used by the frontal lobe, the executive brain, in order to guide performance over time. And that's what working memory is all about. Holding mental representations in mind that are pertinent to the tasks we have to do and that govern our behavior toward our goals and other activities. It's a very special kind of memory. It's not remembering information. That's in the hippocampus of the brain. No, this is remembering the doing, the things we have agreed to do, the promises we've made, the goals we've been assigned, and so forth. Very special function of the frontal, particularly the prefrontal lobes. This is where working memory is located. Now, as I've said, it's this kind of information actively, effortfully held in mind that is guiding behavior over time. And it allows us to do what we know, to perform that knowledge that we acquired. Now, most people don't realize that there are two working memory systems in the frontal lobe that work together. One is the verbal working memory system, predominantly over in the left side, where speech tends to be located in the frontal lobe. And the other is the use of visual imagery and other spatial information that we can also use to guide behavior over time toward our goals. So you can think of this like we think of the GPS in our car or the GPS on our cell phones. We have images and words, self-talk, that guide us over time toward a destination, a goal. So when we have a goal that we have decided to pursue toward a future event that we need to prepare for, we upload the relevant Im images of the past. That's the maps. That's our hindsight. We then also upload our self-speech to enhance that and to give us directions over time. We then think about the best way to pursue our goal. It's like a GPS comparing different routes to see which might be the most efficient. That's foresight. And then we use those images and words 
to guide us toward our destination. Just like this GPS picture of my Apple cell phone GPS here, where we would enter a destination and the GPS would then activate a plan and use images of the route along with verbal guidance of the instructions to get us over time toward our goal effectively. So working memory is very similar to like a GPS device in terms of what information we're using and what it's being used to do, which is to govern behavior over time. So how can we help people, kids and adults with ADHD, make important information physical in order to overcome this working memory problem? So one solution, of course, is to offload the working memory. So we know that people with ADHD don't have adequate working memory, that they cannot do what they know, and so they can't hold information in mind, and it leads them to have this performance disorder I talked about in another video clip here. So as I said there, it's not a problem with knowing what to do, but with doing what you know, and that's that working memory capacity that's allowing us to do that. Skill training will not address this problem because skill training is just putting more information in the back part of the brain about what to do. It doesn't help us do it. So we need to make accommodations in the environment around us, around people with ADHD, even typical people do this, put it at the point of performance in order for it to prompt and cue our knowledge of what to do here, and more importantly, help that information guide us toward the task at hand or the goal that we have decided to pursue. So this is a form of creating prostheses, artificial devices in the environment, scaffolding if you want to call it that, to help people with ADHD recall and use what they know. So what can we do about this problem? Well, there are lots of things that you can do, and you can read about them more in books, but I'm just going to highlight some on the next two slides to get you started here. The most important thing, I think, is to simply understand the principle here. If mental representations cannot be held adequately in mind and can't govern our behavior, then offload those representations outside the brain onto some other external storage device that will be more compelling in our visual field and guide us more likely toward our tasks and goals. So offload working memory. It's a great principle to keep in mind as to how to overcome these problems. And there are a variety of storage devices for doing that, including, hello, paper, sticky notes, cards, signs, symbols, pictures, cues, anything I can get into that visual field put on it the stuff I need to remember, even if it's just little short phrases that prompt me to understand that sequence of activities and put it where I need to perform the work to help me show what I know. Now, you can use high tech as well. You can use digital recording devices. You can use things in your computer like your calendar or Outlook or other sort of time management scheduling devices, and that's fine. But in our experience, they don't work as well as the low-tech paper and pencil, notes and journals, and other things. And the reason for that is that the technology requires a certain amount of investment of time and effort in its own part. First of all, you have to find the device. Hello? Most people with ADHD often wind up misplacing their electronic devices, like their cell phones. Number two, have they charged the battery, right? It's not going to do you any good if it's out of power. Can you find the power cord to charge the darn thing up with? That can also be another problem. And on top of that, most importantly, somebody's got to enter the information in the smart device for that device to do its job through the apps we're using in order to guide our behavior over time. Who's going to do that? Maybe a partner or a spouse, a friend, a parent. But usually the adult with ADHD kind of passes on that because it's a rather boring thing of uploading things in advance that are going to guide us toward our goals and tasks, maybe putting things in a calendar, for instance. So for a variety of reasons, not to mention the fact that the device has to be with you and on in order for it to activate your, your reminders and therefore your behavior, paper and pencil 
that we have found is much better, like a week at a glance calendar, a journal that you keep with you at all times, the sticky notes that we've talked about before, and other things where you can write down what needs to get done, and that paper is there. No power cords, no charging, no devices, no uploading. It's there to work. And I have found for the adults with ADHD that I and my colleagues have worked with, we all report that that seems to do better than high tech. You can also use imagery. You can use pictures. You can pull them out on your computer if you have to be working on your computer and show a image of the reward you're going to get, the goal that you're pursuing. You can also create picture sequences if you have children. These are often used for children on the autism spectrum, but they work well for people with ADHD, particularly kids, where you create picture sequences of various routines and the steps that need to be done so that the picture tells the story. We don't need to be reading lots of do lists to them as to what needs to be done. So you can try that as well. Uh, and there are lots of picture sequences on the internet for use with children and teens on the spectrum or those with ADHD. So think about using those if you can find some that are pertinent to the tasks that you're having trouble with. Simply drawing pictures with arrows on your journal or on a piece of paper that show the sequence in which you want to do these little visual, if you will, hieroglyphs or reminders of the steps in the task, that can also serve like a picture sequence can. In addition to that, make important rules or other reminders, physical as well, using to-do lists. This is more for adults than kids. Kids, we can make short little sticky notes or picture sequences, but for adults, there's nothing like the well-worn out use of do lists that we all use to keep us coming back to task and to pursue the goals we had set for ourselves that morning or that day. So wherever it's important for us to remember certain information, we ought to have paper and pencil and be able to make lists there, including this proverbial do list. As we get older, we can encourage the use of these do lists in a variety of settings, at work, in college, at school, uh, as well as even while we're driving, if we're trying to remember the various errands that we're out running this morning uh, to help our family with whatever the tasks happen to be. Self-talk during tasks can be somewhat helpful to adults, not so helpful to kids, because self-talk in young children isn't very controlling of their behavior the way it is in older teens and adults. But simply talking to yourself, sub-vocally or out loud, while you're doing a task to help keep your mind on task can be another thing that you can do. You can also rehearse strategies beforehand in your mind, rehearsing what are called when-then plans. When I get to work, these are the things that I need to get done. We find that when we have rehearsed information, it is more likely to remain active or more likely to get activated when we finally get into that upcoming situation. It's kind of a way of priming our recall with the things that we had planned to do when we get there. You can even write these plans down if you want to on a file card and take them into work or school or even at home with you to help guide your behavior over time. There's lots of tips there. There's many more, I'm sure, that you can come up with on your own. If you've come up with others that you've found to be very useful tips, would you please share them through the reply button on this video so that others can benefit from your hard-earned wisdom and experience. So uh, thank you so much for uh, participating in this lecture. I hope that you will plan on joining me for my next lecture. Uh, next week, I'm going to, uh, once again, uh, take on Jordan Peterson's theory of ADHD as an inopportunity to play. The reason for that is that out of about 33,000 views, about 10 people were rather critical of the uh, video saying that I didn't cover the evidence adequately that disproves uh, Jordan's theory. Uh, why is it me that has to produce that evidence? In science, it's the person making the hypothesis that has to have the evidence. And as you know, his evidence was weak. But we'll, we'll tackle that next week when we'll give these squeaky wheels a little empirical grease, walk through the information and evidence as to why that uh, particular point of view is dead wrong, uh, what Richard Dawkins might call nonsense on stilts, uh, and show you that uh, this, this idea that immature juvenile rats who were not allowed to play 
uh, went on to develop an ADHD-like behavior uh, was not correct and certainly not applicable as a comprehensive theory of ADHD. So there you go. Uh, come back. I'll try to get that video prepared faster than Barbie can conspire to tackle a cabal of evil white men. Uh, we're going to get on with that video uh, early next week. So thanks so much for joining me. I uh, hope you found this very informative and we will catch you on the next video. Thanks everybody. Be well and keep laughing.